crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And we invite you to like us on Facebook, The Voice Crying in the Wilderness, where you can download all our messages or email us at aboc2019 at gmail.com. And then you can request a message to be emailed. Our speaker is Brother Bert Lever. The ministry is Reach Builders, and we do have him on the call, as you already heard. I'm going to turn the call right over to him, our opening prayer, and then our evening message. Brother Leverett, the time is now yours. Okay, thank you. We're going to begin with a short word of prayer. So just want to invite you to bow your heads. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you so much for giving us life, giving us another day. We ask now that you would forgive us for all our sins. Lord, we want to do what is right in your eyes. And we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to come together and to share your word. We just ask that as we open your word, that the Holy Spirit would be our guest of honor and that he would lead us and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay just kind of uh, talk a little bit about something a little different. I I have been doing some studying on a couple subjects, and, and I haven't really exhausted or studied completely the, these two, the subjects that I'm going to present, but I do believe that we can learn something from uh, at least just a little that I've looked at so far. So the Bible talks a lot about the end times in the book of Revelation, and there are there are at least three chapters that deal with specifically the days the day and time that we're living in, I believe. Revelation thirteen, Revelation fourteen, and Revelation sixteen. Now, as we look at Revelation thirteen, we know that that chapter is pretty clear. It's uh it brings to view the beast power of Revelation thirteen and verses one to eleven or verses one to ten. That's the first beast power. And we know that power is paganism and the papacy. The second beast power is brought to view in verse eleven to verse eighteen. And, uh, you know, it's very clear, uh, that chapter, if you understand prophecy, if you understand the symbology, the symbolism, uh, then you can easily understand that chapter. Chapter 14 deals with the Lamb and the, and the 144,000. So in other words, it brings to view Jesus Christ and the 144,000. And what's interesting about this chapter is it also has, as it relates to the 144,000, it has the message of the three angels. That is the message that I believe really applies to the day and time that we're living in now. Uh, it's a message that we're to fear God. The hour of the judgment has come. Babylon is falling. And if any man worship the beast, then his image. And we know the beast power is the United States together with paganism and the papacy. In other words, spiritualism, paganism, and the papacy will join forces with the United States of America, the United States government, 
and they will pass or impose a law that will restrict religious freedom. And, you know, I just want to say that uh, there's so much happening now that tells us we're, we're very close to the time which that law is going to be passed. In fact, in, in India right now, they just passed a total lockdown every Sunday in India, in, in, in a certain part of India. It's not the whole country. But there is a certain area, a certain part of India, where they have imposed on the people a total lockdown every Sunday. They call it a, you know, a, a day of rest, and it's a lockdown. You can't, anything that's non-essential is not available. So they say that this relates to the COVID-19, and they say that they're trying to, in other words, stop the spread in India, in this part of India. And so to do so, they're imposing this, uh, total shutdown every Sunday, which is interesting that they would uh, do it every Sunday. Now, it's very interesting. Also in the country of, um, I believe it's Tonga, which is a Samoan country, they have pretty much a total lockdown on Sunday or at least a day of rest on Sunday as well. And there are other countries as well. It just hasn't really filtered to the United States of America. But I do, I have been noticing that many of our governmental leaders have been talking about imposing, uh, Sunday rest. The governor of New Jersey mentioned it. President Trump mentioned it back when Easter Sunday came around. Uh, he mentioned about opening up the country on Easter Sunday for the purpose of, uh, you know, recognizing Easter Sunday as the day of rest. And they wanted, you know, obviously everyone to go to church. And then there have been others. Also in Canada, uh, they have pretty much a day of rest on Sunday. Now, I wish it was possible that I could actually show this video, but I actually have a video of the folks over in Canada saying that, you know, it's important to have a day of rest on Sunday. It's important for all businesses to be closed on Sunday. Uh, they call it a Sabbath. They literally say it's a Sabbath. And I think that's just very interesting. It's a telltale sign that we are so close. The only thing that, of course, we have yet to see is to see that imposition or Im imposing of a Sunday law here in America. But we know it's coming. We know it's coming very soon. In fact, we can see the... And I want to just read in Revelation. I want to go to the book of Revelation here in just uh, chapter 13. I want to read verse uh, 11. It says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, we know that that speaking as a dragon has reference to legislating dragon-like principles, whether it be the Sunday law, or any type of law that would impose restriction of, of, of freedom of conscience. In other words, restricting freedom of conscience. And, you know, it could be anything. But I can say this unequivocally and very authoritatively based on what I've seen so far up until this point. I do believe that the imposition of face masks, where they're forcing people to wear face masks, is a step in that direction of the country speaking as a dragon. It is not a fulfillment of Revelation 13, where the country would speak as a dragon. It's a step in that direction. And uh, as we look at it, I mean, they, you know, they, they have all types of uh, steps that are in place to coerce people into wearing face masks is wearing face masks by force. Uh, and, and we know that, you know, it's going to only escalate. It's very mild now, but more and more people, if they don't comply with these mandatory, uh, laws and, and, and restrictions and whatnot as it relates to COVID-19, 
they're going to get more and more stringent. They're going to get more and more, um, um, you know, tighter in their laws and, and, and regulations. Revelation 13, verse 12 says this, He exercised all the power of the first beast before him, caused it the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this idea of the two-horned beast speaking like a dragon is the first step. Second step, exercise the power of the first beast. We know the power of the first beast was not only forcing, but the power of the first beast was a restriction of of freedom of conscience, restricting liberty of conscience, as well as persecuting people who did not comply or people who they call heretics. And, uh, you know, that obviously, you know, at the time when the first beast was in, in power, you know, pretty much the Catholic Church was controlling the state power. We know it was Rome, and we know that Rome was, the civil power, but the Church of Rome controlled the civil government in Rome. And here in America, we're seeing the same thing take place now, ever since 2015 up until now. Obviously, the same principles, the same steps are being followed, but in a very mild way. It's a very non-threatening way. And very soon, it's going to get more, they're going to get more and more bold. They're going to get more and more, it's going to become more and more of an imposition to individuals. If you don't comply, they're going to put more restrictions and more restrictions until finally, uh, you know, they're going to begin to outright force people. This whole move and organization or organizing of contact tracers is a step in that direction. Uh, defunding the police. Also a step in that direction. The stage is being set right now for a national Sunday law. And I do believe that we're going to see it. We're going to see it happen. It's going to happen. It's going to be very mild, as Ellen White said. And then it's going to get more and more drastic, more and more bold, more and more imposing. I want to go to the book Great Controversy. And I want to sort of introduce, and I know I've talked about this before, but I want to just kind of read in that chapter on page 589, I believe it is. Um, you know, she talks a lot about natural disasters or natural events that will take place in the last days that will sort of lead to the passing of the National Sunday Law. Bear with me here as I try to pull it up here. Um and, okay, so it says here on page 589, it says, Through spiritualism, Satan appears as a, as a benefactor of the race, healing the diseases of people, professing to present a new and more exalted system of religious faith, but at the same time he works as a destroyer. His temptations are leading multitudes to ruin, Intemperance to dethrones reason, sensual indulgence, strife, bloodshed follows. Satan delights in war, for it excites the worst passions of the soul and then sweeps into eternity its victims steeped in vice and blood. Now, um, this idea of war, uh, you know, we, we can see kind of that on foot now or being developed now with civil wars and race wars and riots and whatnot. Uh, but she says here that Satan delights in wars because it excites the worst passions of the soul. And that is so very, very true. Uh, when you look at this whole movement surrounding Black Lives Matter and their political agenda, you can see very clearly that you know, this group, this organization, Black Lives Matter, is a very, very liberal and immoral organization. You go to their website, first of all, the first thing you're going to see on their website is very little that has to do with black African Americans. Um, they are a very liberal, multicultural group based on the premise of Marxism, 
or communism, Karl Marx, and their goal is to bring about a communist form of government here in America. And that is the reason why they're pushing. And, and another thing is, you know, part of their their uh, plan is to, you know, restrict liberty of conscience, restrict freedom as we understand it, and just invite total chaos and confusion. Uh, in the book Great Controversy, she talks about how Satan's going to work through the elements of nature. And the way he does that is he's going to sort of work through, she calls it the secret laboratories of nature. And, you know, he's going to use things like hail, hail storms, tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, earthquakes, every place and in a thousand forms. All right. So why am I mentioning all of this? First, we see that the picture is on war. You know, then it moves to Satan working through the laboratories of nature. And then it moves to obviously an upheaval in nature in the form of earthquakes, floods, tidal waves, tempests, tempest, you know, so on and so forth. And then, you know, at that point, the people will then call because at that point we will have realized as a country, as a world, that we've gotten far away from God. And then there's going to be this call for a Sunday, a Sunday day of rest. Now that's sort of the long roundabout route that is being played out right now. Uh, again, war, political war, as well as civil or military war, and then laboratories of nature being sort of manipulated by Satan, which will then bring about all of these events, natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, so on and so forth. And then at that point, there will be so much destruction, so much chaos, so much confusion that the people are going to say, we've got to get back to God. Now, I want to read that because I know I just mentioned that, but I want to show you where she actually writes that in the book, Great Controversy. She says, Then the great deceiver will persuade man that those who serve God are causing these evils. Now, when she's talking about these evils, she's talking about all that I've mentioned up until this point. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their trouble upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a per perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath, that this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance is strictly, notice the word strictly enforced. And the reason why is because it will have been enforced before that. But it will not be strict, just kind of exactly the way the face mask thing is going now. You know, you've got this law, you know, enforcing face masks on everyone, but it's not really strictly enforced across the board. You have some states that don't even impose face masks on their on their I know for for a fact that some of the states in the south, like Alabama and uh, parts of Mississippi, Louisiana, they don't have face mask laws, um, you know, invoked right now. But then you have states like California, New York, Oregon, parts of Washington like Seattle definitely have face mask laws, but it's not strictly enforced. And as you see the numbers spike, like, for example, yesterday it was said that 50,000 new cases, COVID-19 cases, were brought up on the books, 50,000 new cases. They didn't mention how many people died, but they just said 50,000 new cases. And as a result, they used that opportunity to impose face masks. Now, I believe that that is the, the, the you know, when we read in Revelation 13, and I know this may sound like a stretch, but I believe it's, it's really, really a connection between what we read in prophecy, 
what we understand will take place in the last days as it relates to America speaking as a dragon. Uh, you know, in other words, if we know if we know the principles, and by the way, those of you that don't know, the dragon is Satan himself, Lucifer. You can see that in Revelation 12. You go back to Revelation 12, you can see very clearly there in Revelation 12 that um, the dragon in verse 3, it, I'm going to just read it here. It says, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. His tail drew a third part of the hef- stars of the heaven. And then so on and so forth. Skipping down, it says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels prevailed not. Neither was his place. And then in verse 9, it says, The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know that the dragon is none other than Satan, Lucifer, the fallen angel, right? So when America speaks as a dragon, that's when you're going to begin to see America implementing principles that are principles directly from Satan himself. And that principle is that of force. That principle is using fear tactics to control people. You know, the dragon uses fear to control people, right? And that is exactly what we've seen throughout time, from the time of Adam and Eve all the way up until uh, even today. Imposing fear and using fear to manipulate emotions and using the control of emotional emotions and fear to control people individuals that's why the bible says there's no fear in love perfect love casts out all fear because fear has torment so when america begins to implement these dragon-like principles or laws which we see right now with this whole mandatory taste and you know the thing is you know now they're saying you don't have an option you know you have to wear a face mask And then very soon we're going to see that other laws and restrictions are going to come up where you don't have an option. And you know what they'll tell us to try to enforce it? And this is the very mild way of enforcing it now. They're not going to say if you don't wear a face mask, you're going to die. They're not going to say that. That's a little too bold. What they're going to say is if you don't, you have to wear a face mask for the good of your family or for the good of people around you. You know, you, you you don't want to infect other people around you. And so for that reason, we are enforcing face masks for the betterment of all. In other words, so that everyone's safe, we're going to ask that you stay six feet apart and wear a face mask. And then, you know, as things begin to develop, we're going to see these lockdown principles become very, or lockdowns become very, very frequent. Lockdowns, lockdowns, more and more quarantine, self-quarantining, quarantining individuals that were potentially infected with COVID-19. And then we'll move to, and we'll follow through just like India. India right now is saying, parts of India is saying, because of the high uh, spike in cases, you know, every Sunday now, we're going to lock it down every Sunday. All non-essential activity is going to stop on Sundays from now until further notice. That's what India is doing. And by the way, their new cases, the new cases that have spiked in India, represent 564 new cases as of yesterday. Think about that, 564 cases, new cases, in comparison to the many millions of people, billions of people that live in India. And now they're imposing Sunday lockdown. So the same thing in America we see. And, and, and this is moving step by step towards seeing these dragon-like principles totally take over and wipe away all freedom, all religious freedom, freedom of conscience, uh, freedom of, you know, constitutional rights, bill of rights, 
all that's going to go away, and very soon we will see this this forcing of people. Now, I want to go back to Great Controversy. And, all right, now, in Great Controversy, the next step that we see that she brings to view on page 590 is that of miracle working power. Because, you know, the Sunday Sabbath will have been enforced very similar to the way we see face masks being enforced now. Uh, Starting out very mild, just suggesting that everyone just rest on Sunday. Uh, Don't work. All non-essential activities, you know, and then it's going to move to everyone, and then it, pretty soon it's going to move to punishable by death. But obviously that's further down the line. All along, we're going to see this miracle working power. Ellen White talks about that. I want to read it here. She says, the miracle working power manifest through spiritualism will exert its influence against those who choose to obey God rather than man. Communications from the spirits, will declare that God has sent them to convince the rejectors of Sunday of their era, affirming that the laws of the land should be obeyed as the law of God. Now, you know, you can see, I see a, a, you know, I see a very similar move taking place now, but it's not in relation to Sunday, not in relation to Sunday rest. You know, the, Spiritualism joins forces or combines with apostate Protestantism for the purpose of using state power or federal power to force individuals. And Ellen White talks about the people of God. She talks. She, she actually says here that those who obey the law of God, that these powers, spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and the federal government, U.S. government, are going to aim their laws at those that obey God, trying to force them or coerce them into following the laws of man instead of the laws of God, which is what it's all about. You know, this is a battle between whether we're going to serve the laws of man or the laws of God. And I don't want to be critical about this, friends, but I just want us to understand that You know, you don't even have to be a Seventh-day Adventist and no Bible prophecy to see that this is developing this way. I mean, I've I've listened to other people who have nothing to do with Adventists, and they seem to be saying the very same thing. So we know that it's coming, and it's coming fast. When we get to the point to where we begin to see miracle-working power, that would suggest that we're going to see not only a spike in I don't know if you want to call it COVID-19, or but we're going to see a lot of people getting sick. We're going to see a, a lot of people give, getting sick. In fact, in other places in the spirit of prophecy, she says we ought to use this time, you know, Sunday, instead of going to, you know, because it's very mildly enforced, Sunday Sabbath, we ought to use Sunday as a time to do medical missionary work which again suggests the fact that people are going to be getting sick physically. And when people are getting sick, we know the enemy is going to use miracle working power through spiritualism to get people well. And so it's going to be quite confusing because a lot of people are going to really believe that this superpower, spiritualism, apostate Protestantism, and the U.S. leading uh, forces, I'm just going to say, combined together is going to be kind of like this super authoritative power that's able to coerce and force people be based on not only their their military strength, but based on this miracle working power that they have, right? And 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 then things will develop uh, more and more. But she says here that Satan's policy, and on page 591, she says, Satan's policy in the final conflict with God's people is the same that he employed in the opening of the great controversy in heaven. He professed to be seeking to promote the stability of the divine government while secretly bending every effort to secure its overthrow. 
And when you read in Patriarchs and Prophets how he worked in heaven, Lucifer, the fallen angel, you know, the first thing he did was he, he convinced the angels, as many as would listen to him, he convinced them that they didn't really need any type of law, that they were actually, um, you know, they were they were very intelligent beings. And they didn't really need a, a law to govern them. They they were they were actually above law. And then you know as they went about, obviously not recognizing or not giving credence to the authority of God's law in heaven, uh, confusion developed in heaven. And then he would go to God and to Christ and say, "Look at this confusion that's happening here. Uh, maybe maybe I ought to try to." We ought to try to do something to try to uh, stamp out or, or control all of this confusion here in heaven. And so while he's on the one side, he's trying to put down confusion and put down rebellion. On the other side, he's exciting it as well. And so the same thing is happening now today. You've got, you've got, literally, you've got, and I'm just going to say it, you've got uh, Jesuits and you've got, individuals in very, you know, uh, wealthy people that have a lot of money combining to incite race wars, to incite looting, to incite rioting on one side, and then on the other side, you've got the same organization saying, hey, you know, we need to, we need to implement these laws and, and, and we need to try to get control of the people because chaos is in in the streets now and so well, how do they do that obviously you know locking people down is one uh, controlling the money is another closing businesses is another way uh, closing churches is another way uh, and another way obviously is forcing people to wear a mask and stay inside or if you come outside you can only come outside for essential business um you know and it, it's just it's just and taking away people's freedom just freedom to move around freedom you know i was i was looking on the bus you look at public transportation now they they they've got the bus set up now where when you ride on the bus you know you've got to ride in a numbered seat now you know they've got the seats numbered one two three so they'll have two seats side by side with the number one on it and then they'll have one seat that's actually blacked out and closed. And then the seat next to that, they'll have three seats with the number two on it. So if you're in a, a group or a family that has three people in the family, you can sit in seat number two because there's three open seats there. But you can't sit in seat number one because there's only two seats available there. And that's the way all the public transportation is going now. That's to enforce the social distancing thing. And when you think about that, you know, I mean, does that make scientific sense? Really? Does it? If we're, if we're doing something to try to stop the spread of a virus, does it really make scientific sense that we set up our public transportation and we close down all the uh, federal government state parks and, um, you know, close down beaches and uh, limit people from you know, going to bars and restaurants and whatnot and so on and so forth, just limiting people going out in public because of the spread of it. While at the same time, we're forcing everyone out there to wear a mask and to wash their hands and do all these things. Again, does, that, does, it, does it really work? Does science show that when we do that, it stops the spread? I don't think so, friends especially when they're saying it's okay for you to riot in groups of a 100. You can stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder if you're going to riot. If you're going to riot or protest in the streets, you can stand shoulder to shoulder. It's okay in groups of a 100. But you can't, you can't gather on a bus together. I mean, really? You can't go to church? If you do go to church, you got to... Maintain physical social distancing. I mean, really, it's just very, very contradictory and confusing, friends. 
That is because it's the spirit of the dragon that's saying this. That is because the leading officials that are enforcing this, like Fauci and all of those, are Jesuits. And they have one agenda and one agenda only for America, and that is to destroy Protestantism, destroy freedom of conscience, destroy liberty, and impose a Sunday law. And they want to do it as quickly as they can. So where does that leave us? Because, you know, very soon you and I are going to stand out like a sore thumb. We're Seventh-day Adventists. Our name says Seventh-day Advent of Christ. So if we're faithful to what we believe as a people, we're going to we're going to be brought to the forefront. And people are going to say, hey, you know what, for the common good of everyone, you all are going to have to conform to these new laws. This is the new normal. It may seem abnormal, but it is the new normal. We've changed things for the good of all mankind. And so what are we going to do? Just like it was during the time of Daniel and in the courts of Babylon, you know, everyone had to bow down when they heard the music. Whoever didn't bow down, they had to be thrown in the fiery furnace, right? There's a lot that can be said and read in the book Great Controversy. I think this chapter here, The Impending Conflict, is probably one of the most important chapters in the whole entire book. In fact, the last seven chapters of this book, The Great Controversy, in my opinion, is literally present truth right now. Of course, we're right in, you know, uh, the impending conflict, I believe now. Let me just keep reading here. Um, she says this on page 591. She says, the same policy of deception that has marked the history of the Roman church, it has Wait a minute. Okay. The same policy of deception has marked the history of the Roman Church. It has professed to act as the vicegerent of heaven while seeking to exalt itself above God and to change his law. Now, stopping right there, again, what she's doing is she's comparing the Roman Church to the workings of Satan before the fall when he was in heaven as Lucifer. On the one side, he was seeking to uh, foment discord, bring about discord, confusion, rioting in heaven. And then on the other side, he was trying to sort of stamp out all of this confusion by changing and restricting freedoms and changing laws. Because God's law was obviously a, it was a thorn in the flesh in the eyes of Lucifer. Right? So he would go to the angels and say, you know, the problem is that law right there. That's the problem. Then he would go to God and he would say, hey, you know, these angels lost their mind. They're not keeping your law. And the same thing's happening today with the Roman church, and it's happening in America with guys like Tony Fauci and all of them who are, who are bringing experts on television, on CNN, telling us why we need to do what we're doing. And it's very confusing. It just doesn't make sense. But people are doing it because they're confused and scared and, you know, they feel like if they don't do it, they're going to die, drop dead. And so this idea of fear is just gripping everyone to the point where everyone is just sort of blindly following what they're being told without even thinking it through. And as a result, now you've got a lot of people that are, um, you know, they're, they're right on the edge of whether it be suicide and, or just, you know, just scared, fearful. All right. In closing, she says, under the rule of Rome, those who suffered death for their fidelity to the gospel were denounced as evildoers. They were declared to be in league with Satan. And every possible means was employed to cover them with reproach, to cause them to appear in the eyes of the people and even to themselves as the vilest of criminals. Right? So, very same thing happening now. 
If individuals don't wear a mask, if individuals don't social distance, if individuals don't lock down, don't self-quarantine, even though they're well, even though they're not sick, they're, they're being forced to be looked at by the rest of the public as being the vilest of criminals. In fact, they're being treated like criminals, right? And now, you know, we're just dealing with something that has to do with health and safety. Wait until it becomes the issue with the Sunday Sabbath. Same thing's going to happen. She says, so it will be now. While Satan seeks to destroy those who honor God's law, he will cause those to be accused as lawbreakers, as men who are dishonoring God and bringing judgments upon the world. And and that is the reason why, and by the way, you know, when the judgments of God falls, especially on some of the major cities, which we're told in great controversy that that's going to happen, when the judgments of God begin to fall, you can rest assured that the reason why the judgments of God are falling, just like it was during the time of ancient Israel in Egypt under Pharaoh, we learn in that example that the judgments of God fell on Pharaoh and Egypt because of the oppressive measures that were imposed specifically on God's people in the land of Goshen. And the same, very same thing is going to happen here in America. Judgments are going to fall because of the oppressive enactments specifically aimed at those who follow God's law, especially the health laws, especially the Ten Commandment laws as it relates to Sunday or Sabbath, the day of rest. Anyone who's following God's laws, the laws of the land are going to be so skewed and so twisted to where it's going to sort of... uh, cause those individuals to be looked upon as the vilest of criminals, and as a result, they're going to be treated like criminals. Okay, that's what she's saying here. And when they're treated like criminals by oppressive enactments through the government and through the military, the U.S. military, that's when God's not going to keep silent anymore. That's when we're going to see that God is going to rise up and judgments are going to fall And then they're going to convince, the world's going to convince everyone that the reason why these judgments are falling is because of those Sabbath keepers, when really it's the opposite. In closing, I like this statement here, 591. She says, God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resource is to gain control of those whom he cannot otherwise seduce by compulsion, by cruelty. I want to read that again. God never forces the will or the conscience. I want to, you know, and as I'm reading this, friends, I mean, we can really think about what's happening now. Right? She says, God never forces the will or the conscience, but Satan's constant resort is to gain control of those whom he can't otherwise seduce, but is Compulsion by cruelty. Through, listen closely, through fear or force, he endeavors to rule the conscience and to secure homage to himself. To accomplish this, he works through both religious and secular authorities, moving them to the enforcement of human laws in defiance of the law of God. There it is. Great Controversy 591. Very clear. And I think it clearly outlines what we're seeing today. Now, my advice, those of you that are listening, my advice is that you and I, if we, if you are accustomed to spending three times a day praying, I would say double that. Spend six times a day praying. You know, if you were accustomed to having Bible study, Maybe once a day in the morning, I would say do it twice a day. Whatever we have been doing or accustomed to doing, we should really double that and even consider tripling that. Because, you know, the Bible says in the book of Job that we're to acquaint now ourselves with God and be at peace. 
Now is the time for us to make our calling and election sure. We can do that through prayer, Bible study, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You might say, well, my church is not open on Saturdays. Or when my church opens on Saturdays, we can't go because the numbers can only be so and such and such, and, you know, they turn us away. Well, assemble in a house somewhere with with fellow brethren, like-minded people. You know, assemble any and everywhere you can, because the Scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Let us not get to the point to where we're forced through coercion to only worship God via Zoom or via some, you know, um, um, virtual worship service. I mean, really. So next thing I would recommend, um, share the truth. Share the gospel. There are a lot of people that really want to know what we know, what we understand. We know the end of the story. We know it's coming. We know it's about to happen. We know exactly how it's going to happen. You can read this chapter, The Impending Conflict. If I were you, I would. I remember when I was working at Boeing, I used to have what was called thoughts for the day. And I started out passing these little thoughts. I would just write them down on a piece of paper, and I would pass it out to four or five people. And it got to the point after about six months or eight months where I had 23 people on my list that wanted these thoughts for today. And you know what I was giving them for thoughts for today? I was giving them right after this book, Great Controversy. And these people had never read this before, and they would get something every morning. They would get two two sentences out of Great Controversy. And by the next day, they were, what, what you wrote down yesterday was so good. Can you give us more information on you know, and then by the time the end of the month, you know, if if I was able to break down a chapter correctly, planning out the next month, they got a whole chapter in the book Great Controversy. And I would encourage those of you, if you work, you know, if you're still working, maybe somehow if you could figure out a way to write down and, and get the truths of the Great Controversy to your working neighbors and uh, fellow co-workers or whomever you work with or family, whatever the case may be, share the truth. Because there are people that will readily receive it. I'll tell you one last story as I close here. Um, there was a guy that we put an ad when, when I was an elder at one of the churches out in Colts in California. We put a, a full-page ad in the local newspaper in uh I think it was in Pomona. And we took out a full-page ad, and we put the uh, last impendency, the last... It was was a full-page ad on the Mark of the Beast. And it had it all broken down by way of Scripture. It had the name, you know, broken down, Ficarius Filiadi, and how it was broken down to 666. And then it had talked about the implementation of the Sunday Sabbath by law, which would then be the mark of the beast. It had all the statements from the Catholic Church saying that Sunday is the mark of our authority. And then it had all the scriptural references regarding the Sabbath. And it was a full-page ad, and I'll never forget this one young, this man by the name of Rick, who happened to be at the time the associate pastor of one of the largest first-day churches in Riverside, California. He was living in Colton or in Pomona, but he was working at uh, Greg Glory's church in Riverside. Greg Glory is the pastor that does the uh, big um, um, big meetings, I think, once a year in Orange County. And anyway, he was one of the associate pastors there. He happened to read this full-page ad, and he called the number to our church that was on the ad, and Long story short, he, I was I went out to visit him, and we started having Bible studies. His wife, myself, and I took the secretary at our church because she spoke Spanish. His wife was Spanish, and uh, we had Bible studies. The first month went very well. He had a lot of questions, a lot of what he was learning, very different than what was taught at Greg Laurie's church you know, evangelical first-day church. 
But when we got to the subject of the Sabbath and how the Sabbath was going to be changed, because he had read that full-page ad, he got very interested, and he told me, he said, whatever information you have on the change of the Sabbath, I want it. If, if there are any books out, I want them. I immediately went and purchased brand-new hardback, new illustrated great controversies for both he and his wife, and I took them over to, to them, still wrapped in the cellophane cover, and I gave it to them as a gift. I even gave their their kids uh, some, you know, Spirit of Prophecy books, but more on their level. But long story short, he read that whole book, I think in a month or maybe two months. The whole book, he was so fascinated. And then he called me on the phone and he ordered a whole case of those books, Great Controversies. And friends, you know, that was 20 years ago when that happened. You know that? Do you know till this day he and I still communicate? Until this day he's still passing out great controversies? Until this day he's warning everybody he talks to about the change of this app. And he sees that it's coming right now. He sees everything that's taking place in our, in our world today. And he is probably one of the loudest voices out there saying that this, that we're, we're getting ready to see the mark of the beast. And people are listening to him because, you know, he's not telling people that he's Seventh-day Adventist. He's just telling people that he studies Bible prophecy and he's got information that everyone needs to hear. And people are listening. So, friends, when we share the truth, God is going to bring forth, he's going to bring forth the fruit as we share the principles of truth. So never stop sharing. Never stop sharing. And with that, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. If you bow your heads as we, as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the truth. We thank you so much for the prophecies of Revelation 13, 14, 16, as well as the great controversy. All the information that you've given to us is present truth. In the day and time that we see, we see that uh, the spirit of the dragon we can see the spirit of the dragon prevailing in our government and society. We can see the principles of the dragon being implemented and enforced on people nationwide here in America. Uh, we see a lot of people getting sick with COVID-19. We pray for them. We pray, dear Lord, that they would have a speedy recovery. By the same token, Lord, we just pray that you would enable those of us that understand the truth, to live the truth in such a way where we can literally be a, a, a light, a city that's set on a hill, a light in the midst of darkness. As we share our faith, Father, we ask that you would soften hearts to receive the truth. And we just pray, Lord, that you would empower us, embolden us, so that there will be no fear. Because we know that fear is, is contrary to the spirit of love that rules heaven. And we want the spirit of love, Father. It was the spirit of love that brought Jesus down from heaven to die on the cross of Calvary. It was the spirit of love that brought him to rise on Sunday morning. It was the spirit of love that caused Jesus to intercede before the Father in the heavenly sanctuary even now. So, Father, we want that same spirit of love as we share the truth with our neighbors and our friends. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Bert, for that uh, wonderful message that you just shared with us. Could you share your contact information with us, please? Sure. Uh, so my contact information, I'm going to give you my email. It's blever, B-L-E-V-E-R, 1201 at gmail.com, and I'm going to give out my cell phone number, those that want to maybe contact me via cell phone. It's area code 951-538-9984. Again, that's area code 951-538-9984. Thank you so much. All, all requests for a CD should be sent to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. P.O. Box 8441, Laverne, California, 91750-8441 with a $5 donation for each CD to cover shipping and materials. 
make checks or money orders payable to Vaughn Williams. All prayer requests can be emailed to our email address, posted on our Facebook page, or text or call Sister Jackie at area code 773-415-1562. We thank all of our callers for uniting with us in daily prayers on financial support for our speakers on a monthly basis. Thank you, Brother Burke, again for the wonderful message that you shared with us. Amid discord and strife, a voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice, a voice startling and stern, yet full of hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's taken from Desire of Ages, pages 104. And until we meet again, goodbye.